myotonic dystrophy is one of the most variable conditions uh, known to medicine. Now what that means in practice, even more so than other branches of medicine, is that there are no two patients who are really quite the same. And of all the things you'll hear today about clinical aspects of myotonic dystrophy, I think we're really talking about generalities. Um, and what tends to happen sometimes is one patient will say, well, you just said that happened, but it hasn't happened to me. Uh, or you just said this uh, can happen, will it happen to me in the future? So we do have problems with generalities. And, and when you ask me or, or the other medics questions later on, I think we will very much try and confine ourselves to answering generalities rather than your specific problem. But obviously you should be addressing those specific problems um, to your specialist. Um, slightly disconcerting to hear earlier on somebody saying, well, they don't have a specialist. And I think uh, most of us would agree that patients with myotonic dystrophy should be under at least periodic review uh, with somebody who understands the disease. But I think that actually partly reflects um, the historical approach of doctors to myotonic dystrophy. And certainly some of the, uh, the older ones of you in the audience will remember the days when really doctors, neurologists in particular, geneticists to some extent, um, were seen really as the person who would make the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy. And then often the impression you would get, well they might actually say, there's a got myotonic dystrophy, there is no cure for the condition, there's nothing else to do for you, go away. And I think some of the older patients here probably were seen many years ago, were diagnosed and told that nothing had to be done going away, and so aren't under long-term management. But I think that's changed, and there are now a number of um, clinicians in Britain, mainly from the fields of neurology, genetics, and rehabilitation medicine, and many of them who are here today, uh, who are interested in long-term management. And doctors traditionally, or neurologists traditionally, aren't necessarily very good at treating people. What they can do is coordinate the work of others. And the management of myotonic dystrophy is very much a multidisciplinary approach. And um, you'll meet many people here today um, who are involved in the multidisciplinary management of uh, myotonic dystrophy. One of the other difficulties of speaking to an audience like you is that some of you are really old hats and long enough to have been coming to the conferences for 24 years to three? Yeah. Um, but how many people here today are here for the first time? So that's really good, I mean, a third quarter of you are for the first time. And how many people have had a diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy made in themselves or the family in the last year? Okay, so there are a lot of people who are new to it. How many people have known about myotonic dystrophy for more than 20 years? So, the problem with talking is that the needs of the first group and the needs of the second group are very different. And when Margaret asked me to speak, when we were talking about what I might speak about, um, we ended up with the very unhelpful title that we chose of a neurologist overview of myotonic dystrophy. Really, this neurologist overview of myotonic dystrophy. But one thing that Margaret did ask me to uh, touch on specifically, because there have been many questions about it, is brain involvement, cognitive involvement, behavioural involvement in myotonic dystrophy. Uh, I'm going to touch on that and I'm going to approach it uh, in, in a very specific way. The other thing I just want to dismiss, there was a question earlier on about DM1, DM2. I think there is still confusion amongst patients about the difference between the two. They are essentially, totally and utterly unrelated as far as patients are concerned. You can't, for example, have a family where some have DM1, some have DM2. Uh, is there anybody here with DM2? The lone hand in the background. So you can go home. <laughs> but the reality is, although there are some similarities between the conditions, there are also major differences. And I think it's almost confusing that we call them type 1 and 2, because there are so many more differences than similarity. Although, as you heard from David and Sam, in the laboratory, there are important similarities which may be relevant with respect to treatment. What um, 
I'll start talking about is the phenomenon that is very evident in myotonic dystrophy called anticipation. Who here has heard of the word anticipation in myotonic dystrophy? Right, would any one of you like to stand up and say what it means? <laughs> no, okay. And anticipation, um, is, what it means very simply is that the disease, the condition, the disorder is more severe in the next generation than the previous generation. That's very simply what it means. And myotonic dystrophy arguably shows anticipation, but it doesn't behave quite as simply as you think. And what I want to talk about is the differences between the generations and the severity of the condition. And incorporating within that the comments that Margaret specifically wanted me to talk about, which was the cognitive, the, the brain involved. Now, anticipation, very simply, it just means it gets worse from one generation to the next. And you're all familiar with that to some extent uh, from myotonic dystrophy. And we know now what the mechanism of that is, but we didn't know that 20 years ago, 30 years ago. <laughs> and going back to the middle part of the last century, the neurologists kept on saying myotonic dystrophy shows anticipation. You'll see one person with it and that child has more severe disease. But we know it's a genetic condition. It's inherited as what we call an autosomal dominant disease. If you've got it, each child has a 50-50 chance of getting the condition. It's very simple. And the geneticists, the molecular biologists, said anticipation can't exist because the person is handing on that genetic abnormality to the child and they're handing it on to the next generation. It's the same genetic abnormality. Therefore, the disease must be the same in everyone. And the only reason you think there's anticipation is because if we diagnose him as having myotonic dystrophy, we then start looking at his children from the age of one, looking very carefully to see if they've got any problems. And we identify the problems earlier than we did in the parent. So the genetics said, that what must be happening. You're just looking harder, you're looking more closely. And then, of course, in 1991, as David got and colleagues identified the genetic abnormality, which gave us really a completely new insight into a genetic mechanism. And this gene, you've heard all about it from David and Sam already, is unstable. And the genetic abnormality can get bigger. And the basis of anticipation was that if one individual passes on the abnormality to their child, the child may indeed have a bigger genetic abnormality than the parent. So we finally identify that there was a genetic basis for anticipation, which explained why the child might be more severely affected than the parent. And most of you are familiar, and David talked about it earlier on, the triplet repeat expansion. And the bigger the expansion, don't use fancy technical words, the bigger the abnormality, the more severe the condition tends to be. And there's a broad but only a broad correlation between the size of the expansion and the severity of the problem. The bigger the expansion, the more severe the problem. Many of you, when you've been diagnosed, will have been told you have got 235 CTG repeats, 500 repeats. Some laboratories now don't report the size of the repeat. And you'll ask the doctor, well, how big was the repeat? He says, I don't know, or the laboratory won't tell me. <coughs> and part of the reason for that is that the correlation really is very broad. And it doesn't allow us really any major prediction of what the condition is going to be like. And the clinical assessment of the patient is far more important than the genetic result, with some exceptions. OK, so. The disease, as it passes from one generation to the next, may become more severe. But it's not as simple as being more severe. It is not that the child is more severely affected in the same way as the parent. And what we now recognize is that depending on the age of onset of the problem, the actual features of the condition are very different. 
partly goes back to Peter Harper's point about the variability of the disease. And clinically, if we look at patients with myotonic dystrophy, people who've got this genetic abnormality, we really recognize four very distinct subgroups of patients. There aren't really four absolutely subdivided groups. There's an overlap between each of the groups. But for practical purposes, it's easiest and most helpful to think of four distinct conditions. And the one that is the most prevalent, the one that probably affects most people here with myotonic dystrophy, is what we call the classical or adult onset form of the disease, what Steiner described 100 plus years ago. I'll get to describe the features of that just as a reference point for the discussion of the other conditions. And classical or adult onset myotonic dystrophy can come on really any age between late teens to middle age. So there isn't a single age of onset. And it presents in different ways in different people, sometimes very uniquely. But the commonest presentation, the commonest way it comes to light, is typically somebody with involvement with their hands. And they may be aware of one of two things, either weakness of the hand, or the characteristic phenomenon of the disease, myotonia, the stiffness of the hand. And those symptoms, the hand problems, often come on in adolescence, but aren't recognized until much later. And may not be recognized except in retrospect when the diagnosis is made for some other reason. So the patient may present at the age of 30, for example, a woman giving birth to a child with congenital myotonic dystrophy, which will come to later. And the doctors go to her and say, well, have you had any problems in the past? And the woman said, no, nothing wrong with me. And then you ask her in a little bit more detail, and she said, well, I've always had stiffness in my hands. I always thought I had a bit of rheumatism. When I ring out a clock, I can't let go. Um, I can never get bottle tops undone. I always have to give the bottle to my husband to take the lid. So one of the earliest symptoms is often to do with the hand, but it's often not recognized. And when I see somebody for the first time and then we make a diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy, what I can do very simplistically is say to them, well, what we will now discuss, we'll just go from literally from top to bottom and discuss how this condition can affect you. And also leading on from that, how it might change in the future. So, We've got a young adult who's come along with some symptom. We've made the diagnosis of myotonic dystrophy. And we ask them questions about their health from top to bottom. And we start with the eyes. And as many of you all know, the eyes, there are two features of the eyes that we see in an adult with myotonic dystrophy. One is the development of cataracts. Now, we all get cataracts when we get older. The only feature of the myotonic dystrophy, we'll hear more about this later, is that they tend to come on at a younger age. And if the ophthalmologist sees somebody at the age of 30 with cataract, they really ought to be thinking, could this be myotonic dystrophy? And the other problem with the eyes is the droopiness of the eyelids, the ptosis, which in some people, as you know, can be very marked. Then there are the problems around the mouth area. Problems with speech, the intelligibility of the speech, stiffness of the tongue, Difficulty swallowing, difficulty chewing food because of the myotonia, the stiffness of the muscle, and also difficulty swallowing due to weakness of the throat muscles. What we also very frequently notice, although patients don't often notice it when we first see them, is weakness of the facial muscles. And when they smile, the lips don't move quite properly. Putting the lips together, they don't pronounce properly. Closing the eyes can't fit tightly. But that very rarely causes problems. And then we find weakness of the neck muscles. And some of you will have experienced the problem lying flat in bed and you can't lift your head off the bed. And then in the arms and the legs, what you see is weakness, which is unusual for muscle diseases. Most muscle conditions cause weakness around the shoulders and around the pelvis. Myotonic dystrophy always starts with problems around the hands and sometimes around the ankles. Now that's the pattern of weakness, that distribution of weakness. 
helps us make the diagnosis. Now, the one other thing that we talk about is the brain involvement. And as you've already heard from Sam and David, this is a, what we call a multi-system disease. It doesn't just affect muscles. Many other muscle diseases that the muscular dystrophy campaign involved with just affect the muscles. But this affects many, many different parts of the body. And that includes the brain. And if you look at the adult, this classical adult onset form myotonic dystrophy, brain involvement <coughs> is very variable. Now, in some people, they have no significant problems at all. But it was shown many years ago that if you measure IQ, which is a blood test of intellectual function, if you look at a population of people with myotonic dystrophy, the mean IQ tends to be a little bit lower than the population without myotonic dystrophy. But within that, band, you've got people with very high IQ and some with really quite low IQs. But as a broad spectrum, the mean is slightly lower. What is interesting about that is that, as you all know, the muscle problems tend to get worse as time goes on. The cataracts get worse as time goes on. The risk of heart problems get worse as time goes on. But the cognitive, the brain, doesn't really seem to change very much. So if your IQ at the age of 20 is 110, probably still going to be 110 when you're 50, even though your muscles may be a lot weaker at that time. So that sort of intellectual um, difference isn't all that important in terms of long-term change. The most common brain feature we see is the problem of excessive daytime sleepiness, the tendency to drop off to sleep during the day. Um, in some people, that really is very, very marked. And occasionally as the presenting feature, some people may be seen with that as the first symptom. And in some people, it is very, very disabled. And I remember Margaret, I've told this many, many times, she told stories about me, I've told stories about her. The, 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 the problem within the family when one partner has got the condition, and they're sitting down in the evening talking together, and the unaffected spouse is talking merrily to the other spouse, but then falls asleep in front of them. And I'm sure many of you will have experienced situations like that. And it can be incredibly, incredibly uh, disabled. And um, some of you will know that we and others have shown that there are drug treatments available that can be very helpful after that. So excessive daytime sleepiness is uh, a really important problem. The other psychological, cognitive, brain uh, issue is what we talked about. And if you go back to the older, arguably less kind medical literature, it will say patients with myotonic dystrophy are apathetic. They lack drive. That is true, but like all the things we've talked about, is incredibly variable across the spectrum. And there are some very driven, high achieving people with myotonic dystrophy. At the bottom end of the range, there are some, I suspect you will know some of them, who are very apathetic, lack drive, and just sit down all day and do nothing. It has to be said, there are a few of those in the general population as well. <laughs> But I think Peter Harper in his book, if it wasn't in his book, certainly in discussions with him, going back 40 years ago when he was starting to look at myotonic dystrophy and well, and he was going out to people's homes to meet them at home to chat with them. And it may have been an operable tale, but he would say, I could always, when I got to the end of the road and looked down, I could always tell which house I was going to by the unkempt garden. <laughs> I think that sort of thing, although that's an extreme, you will, I think, recognize that in, in, in some people with myotonic dystrophy. So that's the, the typical picture of adult myotonic dystrophy, incredibly variable, presenting in some people at the age of 15, being very problematic, and other people not presenting up to their 30s or their 40s. And what I've not talked about uh, is the heart involvement that can happen in myotonic dystrophy. One of my old friends here is Sandy points out his new implant will defibrillate it to me uh, today. Uh, so the heart involvement is a very important uh, management issue. And also the breathing muscle involvement, essentially the chest 
planted a, a, a broad outline <coughs> of typical myotonic distribution, adult onset myotonic distribution. The next of the four categories I'm going to mention is the one that's milder than that, i.e. typically the parent of the person I've just described. And that person, quite likely, will never trouble a doctor. And the only reason we know about them is because we go and look at them when we've identified the person with the classical form I've just described. And we say to them, you know, are your parents still alive and well? You know, they're in their 60s, no problems at all. We then sometimes go and look at them. And there may be very minor features. One parent may say, well, I have cataracts at the age of 50, but I'm otherwise perfectly well. But the early onset of cataracts was related to them carrying one of these small abnormal expansions. Well, we sometimes call that either the late onset or the asymptomatic or um, pre-symptomatic group of, of uh, patients. The third group I want to mention, uh, which will be familiar to some of you, uh, has been mentioned already, is the group called congenital myotonic dystrophy. And in Libby's slide, she showed a, a, a graph of the age range of the patient with the condition of the diagnosis. And you saw one that had congenital myotonic dystrophy as a separate group to DM1. Not really an artificial distinction. The word congenital has a very, very specific meaning in medicine. And what it means is, is that the condition, the disorder, is evident at birth. Now, obviously, with a genetic condition like myotonic dystrophy, the genetic abnormality must be there when you're born. You're created with it. But congenital very specifically means that when the baby is born, the examination of the baby will show abnormalities. The term in medicine is something I use a little loosely, but that's what it means precisely. And the child with myotonic dystrophy, like the adult with a classical form, has a very specific pattern of involvement. And it's not the same as the adult form, but just more marked at birth. It's different. And at birth, what the doctors notice, what the parent notices, is that the baby is floppy. What the term equipped to as a medical term is hypotonia, lack of muscle tone. And the baby in the is floppy, very accurate descriptive term. And often at birth, because of the muscular weakness, the child has difficulty feeding, difficulty sucking, and difficulty breathing. And in those who are very severely affected, some of those will not survive the neonatal period. But what we generally refer to as congenital myotonic dystrophy, as well on the slide, is the child who's born like that and may need nasogastric feeding for a few days, may need to be in an oxygen tent for a few days, but then those problems seem to settle down. And after that, the child can breathe perfectly adequately, can feed perfectly adequately. At birth, they have quite marked weakness of the facial muscles. And the facial appearance of the child with congenital myotonic dystrophy is very evident. And they carry that facial appearance with them later on in life. And many of you will be aware of this. Patient relatives from, uh, with the typical appearance of the mouth, the sort of upturned uh, mouth in the middle, rather droopy looking face, or something with a rather hanging jaw appearance. <coughs> But the muscles, you might think, well, they've got a much more severe condition than that parent. They're going to be very weak. But in fact, that's not really what happened. And these children, they are maybe a little bit slow in developing their motor skills, the ability to walk, the ability to run. A so-called motor milestone, they're just a little bit delicate. But they get through those. And they generally have rather slim muscles. They're not terribly strong children, but the weakness isn't a major feature. And indeed, it stays remarkably constant. And when you see them going through childhood, through adolescence, into early adult life, 
in that stage, the weakness changes only very slowly with time. But for these children, the thing that is arguably the most important problem for them, the problem for the family, the problem for their future, <coughs> is to do with the brain, to do with the intellectual development. And children who have this congenital form, that's evident when they're born, invariably have learning difficulties. Again, like all things myotonic dystrophy, it's very varied. But most of those children are going to need some form of learning support at school. Some may need to go to special needs school. But again, like the problems in the adult, those problems tend to remain constant. They do progress with time. And one of the odd things about myotonic dystrophy is that the brain features don't show much progression with time, whereas as many of you will be aware, the muscles, for example, do undoubtedly deteriorate with time. In some of the children, there are specific aspects of behavior and performance that attract specific diagnostic labels. Um, the question that Margaret asked me many months ago now was, would I talk, because somebody had asked about it, Asperger's syndrome in congenital myotonic dystrophy. Um, many of you will have heard the name Asperger's syndrome. Um, it is a syndrome. What syndrome means is there are many different causes for it. There isn't a single specific cause. And Asperger's syndrome simply describes a particular personality trait. Um, in the lay press, I, I think the common uh, experience of Asperger's syndrome are people who become very focused on one particular area. So train spotted or often thought of as having Asperger's syndrome. Uh, people with a very obsessional um, activities in one area uh, are often described as having Asperger's syndrome. But it's a, it's a range of conditions. But children with congenital myotonic dystrophy often show behavioral problems as well as the learning difficulty problem. And as the child gets older, I say the motor function is actually very good. They will run around at school, they'll play games, but the limitations in life are going to relate to their learning difficulties. And a very small proportion of children with congenital myotonic dystrophy will ever achieve what all would regard as totally independent existence, living on their own, looking after themselves, <coughs> being in full time employment. Many of them will succeed with support from family, from sheltered accommodation, and sheltered working environments. As I said, their condition tends to remain relatively constant, although when they get older, when they get into their 20s and 30s, then you'll start to see some decline in their motor function, in their, in their muscle function. Unlike the adults, they are also at risk of having heart problems, and breathing problems need to be monitored. The fourth group um, is, was really the last group to be specifically identified, and that's the group that we call childhood onset. And what that means is at birth, the child is not noted to have any problems whatsoever. And in the first year or so of life, there was no suggestion of any problem. But the problems became evident when the child was sort of three, four, five, six, seven, in that young age period. And typically, what is first noted, interestingly, are behavioural problems, psychological problems, need for support at school, uh, other broader psychological issues. And also, sometimes in those children, as well as the children with congenital myotonic dystrophy, um, there are problems with controlled bowel function. That's a relatively common feature. And so the child presenting with rather non-specific psychological problems, learning difficulties, problems with fecal soiling, lack of bowel control, is actually a relatively common problem going to paediatricians. And quite often they fail to make the diagnosis because the child at that stage doesn't necessarily show any of the typical muscle features that will allow us to make the diagnosis in an adult. And one of our colleagues in the Netherlands uh, 
a few years ago now, 15, 20 years ago now, really identify this childhood group as being a particular subgroup of myotonic dystrophy. And so we recognize the four subgroups. The reason for them is the difference in size of the underlying genetic abnormality, but each group has its own particular characteristic and in many ways look different to the other groups. And back to the question Margaret asked me, the psychological features, at the end of the day, many adults have no significant problems at all. Some do. Excessive daytime sleep has been one of the most common problems. <laughs> Dry back of the issues can be a feature in some people. But in children with an early onset form, in general form, learning difficulties, some kind of behavioural traits as well, uh, can be problematic. Now, I'm going to finish by saying that all of these things, all the things I've talked about, all of the features, the, the brain features, the eye problems that I've mentioned, uh, the breathing problems in some people, uh, the risk for heart involvement, which is potentially fatal in the lab, requires what we call what is obviously called a multidisciplinary approach to management. And there is no one doctor who will be expert in all of those areas. And to be honest, I think the average GP is not in the best position to be guiding management of the patient because they simply do not have the experience of breath or problems associated with this condition. I frequently point out to patients that as you will know that the prevalence of myotonic dystrophy is about one in every 8,000 of the population. The average GP has a practice size of 2,000. A simple statistic, only one in four GPs is likely to have somebody on that list with myotonic dystrophy. And that GP will have only one patient or probably one family, but what they will not have this experience of the breadth of the condition. They will only know about those individuals. Now that is why I would strongly advocate that anyone with myotonic dystrophy, really any of those four groups, perhaps, perhaps ignoring the last group of the very, very mild effects, really should be under some form of regular surveillance. And that typically means visiting a specialist like one of us here today once a year. And what the specialist is doing is making sure that all the individual things have been dealt with, such as heart involvement, and many of you will have your annual ECGs, looking at breathing function, looking at swallowing. So I really would encourage people, if they're not already under a specialist, to try and get under one. The problem is there are a limited number of people who do have an interest in here. And I'm afraid it is probably still true to say that in some parts of the country, if you're referred to the local neurologist or geneticist, they will have <coughs> no, little knowledge of the condition. Um, and to, to be honest, also some have little interest in the condition. And that's where I think patients go along to the doctor and go away from them afterwards thinking, well, that was, no, that was a waste of time. They haven't done anything to help them. And you heard earlier on about the uh, attempts that Sam's work looking for a cure for myotonic dystrophy. And of course, that's what everyone wants at the end of the day. But the reality is, there isn't going to be a cure tomorrow. And even if there is a cure tomorrow, those of you who've got advanced features of the condition already, it's not something you're going to get back to normal. And so for many, many years to come, there's going to be need for multidisciplinary input and capital management of the um, I think there's no doubt whatsoever that groups such as the Myotonic District Support have <coughs> promoted the, the well-being and the better management of patients with myotonic dystrophy. So I think we say thank you very much to Margaret and team. Uh, and I think it's wonderful that uh, since 170 will be here today, which uh, is, a, uh, is fantastic. And I hope the new people have learned a little bit about the condition today. And I hope the old hands have fallen asleep. Well, <laughs>